I will leave the details to the pure mathematicians down there in the comments. Make sure to leave some comments down below. I would highly enjoy your intuitive and nice explanations regarding this phenomenon. This is a wave pendulum. The pendulum structure in itself consists of n many uncoupled simple pendulums, meaning we have ball bearings hanging from approximately massless strings where no two pendulums are in direct contact with each other. After positioning the pendulum at a certain angle away from the origin and then letting go, we can notice that at first all balls follow the same track but soon enough start swinging at different rates. The small difference in frequencies allows the structure to trace out all kinds of wavy patterns and creates some beautiful looking kinetic art in the process. Hey Vsauce! Andrew here! Besides this pretty dope presentation of harmonic behavior, one could ask a few questions about this physical system. How can we describe it mathematically and how much does a prime number weigh? Also, will all pendulums be able to reach their initial constellation yet again? Since we are dealing with a system of simple uncoupled oscillators, meaning we have oscillators, pendulums, which do not interact with each other, okay, they are simply spent one after another, but each pendulum is on its own, we can easily describe it using a Newtonian approach. It's as easy as it is. Also, what I want you to notice is that we are dealing with approximately massless strings of a certain length L. Also, we have those ball bearings, which have a certain mass M, and also, our string traces out a triangle shape right here. This is just for the purpose that we only want our pendulum to swing in two dimensions. And actually this triangle shape keeps it stable in the set direction. So we do not have any displacement in the set direction right here. Now, let us bring our pendulum into motion and stop. Let us draw a little coordinate system into here. And you might notice that our pendulum is going to trace out an initial angle phi. And the only force acting on our ball bearing with a certain mass m is simply a component of the gravitational force. I'm going to call it fp right here. It's going to keep our pendulum on the circular path. Now, since it's only a component of our main force, the gravitational attraction, we can actually find it out using simple trigonometry. We have a projection of our triangle with angle phi at the ball, where our forces act on, meaning the sine of phi is equal to the force we are after over the gravitational force, which is acting in the negative y direction. Solving for fp, we get by Newton's second law of motion that mass times acceleration is equal to negative m times g times the sine of phi. Our yet unknown acceleration is also just a change in frequency over time times the length of our string l. This stems from the fact that our ever-changing arc length that is being traced out can be differentiated twice with respect to time. With our differential equation thus being acquired, we can go ahead and put in some more assumptions into the mix. Okay, you know, physicists are bad at mathematics most of the time. Feynman sucks, okay, with, with that out of the way. We want to make calculations for us boys easier. Now, at first I want you guys to notice that our mass m and our length l are actually non-zero. Meaning, since we are dealing in the field of real numbers, we can divide by non-zero parts. Isn't that fucking fantastic? Okay, let us divide by m and l, and thus we are going to end up with a little expression for our phi double dot. Now, I want you guys to remember that I proposed our initial angle phi to be really small. Okay, basically I'm really small. Okay, like 5 to 20 degrees, I really don't care. But the point right here is, we can thus make use of the fundamental theorem of engineering, FTOE, to actually approximate our motion to being of a simple harmonic kind, and thus ending us up with the equation for the harmonic approximator. Solving this differential equation is actually quite easy using an ansatz and some black math magic. So if you are interested in the details of solving this simple differential equation, take a look into the description. There will be a link to the corresponding video solving the second order ordinary differential equation. As always on this channel, links down there in the description to get yourself to the corresponding videos. Our angle phi can thus be written as some amplitude times the cosine of the angular frequency times t, where our 
amplitude is basically nothing other than the solution to the initial value problem phi of zero being equal to phi naught, where phi naught is the angular displacement that we assume to be really small in the beginning. Now this is our equation of motion for our pendulum and now we can get back to our questions that we have asked at the beginning. So at first, can we describe the system mathematically? Yes, we can. But what about the weight of the prime numbers? I guess we'll never know. But how about this? We can actually do some more analysis to find out if our pendulums are actually going to be able to be back at the start, all together, where they once were. Now, what does it mean for them to be at the start again? Well, this has been fine naught the initial angular displacement, they are going to swing and maybe they are going to be all at phi naught yet again. Meaning we want to see how many periods it takes, full periods, for our pendulum to be at the initial angular displacement yet again. Meaning we can plug this fact into our differential equation solution. Phi naught is thus equal to phi naught times the cosine term. Under the condition that phi naught is not equal to zero, we can divide by it. Meaning we are going to get that the cosine term has to be equal to one. Luckily enough, our cosine is two pi periodic. Meaning always when our argument of the cosine is equal to two times pi times k, where k is out of the positive or net negative integers, we are going to arrive at the point one. This is what we want. Now we are going to set our argument of the cosine equal to two pi, meaning we can solve for our time it takes, the so-called period time, capital T, and this is going to result in two times pi times the square root of L over G. One other thing to note is that our period time is actually a function with respect to our length L. Meaning all the other things in there like the gravitation and the constant and 2 times pi are actually constants. Okay, meaning the only thing that can really change our period time is our length. And this comes really apparent if you take a look at two different pendulums with different lengths. Okay, a shorter pendulum is going to swing way faster than a longer pendulum. So it does make perfect sense. And if you take a look at our mathematical formulas that we have just acquired, it does make even more sense. Now we have talked about the situation for one pendulum when it's at the starting position again. Now what about two pendulums or even more pendulums? What about n pendulums? When are they going to be at phi naught yet again? Let us find out. For this, I would like to take a look at a really simple example. Let us consider two pendulums. The first one with a length L1 being equal to one centimeter, for example, and another one with four times the length, meaning L2 is four times L1, four centimeters in this case. Now, one thing you could think about is that the longer pendulum is going to have a longer period time. So it has to swing less than a shorter one to get back to the initial phase. Phi naught. Now we are going to consider ourselves the ratio of those two period times t1 over t2 and you are quickly going to notice that the two pi terms are constant are going to cancel out, square root of g is going to cancel out and we are going to end up with square root of 1 over square root of 4 which is going to simplify to one half. And now here's the final result which is really important for what we are going to talk about next. If we were to multiply by 2 and t2 respectively, we are going to end up with this really important relationship. Both pendulums will be in their initial phase again if our shorter one did two full swings and the longer one has done one full period. Full swings mean integer values of periods here in this context, if you didn't notice already. Meaning if we were to take a look at two pendulums, one with 1.44 meters, maybe you can already see something here, and one with one meter, then we take the ratio, we are going to end up with square root of 1.44 over 1.0, meaning we could expand this fraction by 100 over 100, ending us up with the ratio being 12 over 10. Now we can multiply both sides yet again and we are going to end up with 10 t1 being equal to 12 t2. Now this only really holds if we can expand our square root, our radicand, into perfect squares yet again. If we were to have the situation where square root of 2 over 3, there would be no way to expand those irrational numerator and denominator into something which is a perfect square. Meaning overall, our pendulums are never going to be able to meet again at the starting position. 
I will leave the details to the pure mathematicians down there in the comments. Make sure to leave some comments down below. I would highly enjoy your intuitive and nice explanations regarding this phenomenon. Now we have talked about the one pendulum case and the two pendulum case and now we can go ahead and talk about the three pendulum case. We are going ways right here my boys and girls. I'm so proud of you. You are real physicists. Okay. You should all get your bachelor's and master's in physics. You are so gifted. Now <laughs> we are going to take our pendulums as before one centimeter and four centimeters. We are going to put a third one to the mix. Okay. Perfect square nine centimeters. This works out. Okay. <laughs> Now, I want you guys to notice that our pendulum with the 9 cm is now our longest one, meaning it has to do the least amount of full periods, okay? For them to be all at the initial position again. I'm a swingy boy this time. I'm doing a lot of swings right here. Now, what you have to do is you have to calculate all the pairs of our ratios that are possible. And it's just like with the handshake combinatorics thing, you are going to end up on n many pendulums with n times n minus 1 over 2 pairs you have to check. It's easy to verify, really easy. It's just little goals, okay, with a little restriction. Now, t1 over t2 we have already checked. Now what about t1 over t3? It's going to give us one third, meaning our shortest pendulum has to do three swings, whereas our longest one has to do one swing. Now what about t2 over t3? Okay, this is going to give us two thirds, meaning our middle pendulum number two has to do three swings, whereas our longest pendulum has to do two swings this time. Now here's the process that you are going to go through. You are going to take the least common multiple of all the ratios we have discovered right now. One, two and three. So those were the number of swings we have discovered up until now. Least common multiple of those three is six, okay? Meaning our shortest pendulum has to do six swings and then you are simply going to take the ratio that we have for our middle pendulum and the longest one, two and three. Meaning our longest pendulum has to do two swings, our middle pendulum has to do three swings and our shortest pendulum has to do six swings. And thus they are all going to be in their initial position again after those integer numbers of periods. And once again, please note that this only works for perfect squares or stuff that we can actually expand into perfect squares. And just once again, if you want to take a look at n pendulums, it's just like with hand shaking. It's simple little gauss, okay? I have talked about this before on this channel. And just with the restriction that the nth pendulum can't shake hands with itself, okay? you. If you do the ratio of the nth pendulum with itself, it really doesn't make too much sense. Meaning you are going to end up with n times n minus 1 over 2 pairs that you have to check. And this is going to turn into an ungodly amount of effort and calculations in the process. So if you take a look at the pendulum I had with the 13 balls, ball bearings, then you are going to end up with 13, 13 times 12 over 2 is going to give us 13 times 6 is 78 pairs that you have to check. It's a lot of effort you have to put in if you really want to find out for n many pendulums when they are going to be at their initial angular displacement yet again. Yeah, but it is what it is, okay? It's physics, it's a lot of effort. You have to do a lot of approximations and shit like this, okay? It's just what it is. I'm not releasing too much physics content on this channel, I know, but I'm going to try and improve on this point. I swear to God, I would love to bring out more physics related videos on this channel and I'm, and I'm going to do so very soon. Just wait for Papa Flemmy's advent calendar for example. Over the course of the video you might have noticed that even such a simple physical model brought a lot of calculations with it. It's really hard to explain mathematically the behavior of such simple models. It was just a pendulum. How hard can it be? But even we put a lot of restrictions on this whole thing like no friction involved etc such that we can even explain it. And it's like this with all of experimental physics. It's just really hard to do. And translating physical models into the language of physics, meaning mathematics, it's not an easy feat. It's a skill you have to strengthen. The best way to strengthen the skill is by trying it out, okay? Grab yourself a ball, let it roll down an inclined plane and start formalizing the process. And one very cool way to do so is by using Brilliant.org, today's sponsor. 
Brain.org is an online learning platform with a huge repertoire of all the courses and scientific topics you could possibly think of, be it classical mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics, Lacrosian mechanics, what other kinds of mechanics are there, Hamiltonian mechanics, or dozens of mathematics or computer science related courses. They really have you covered for your lifetime's worth. By solving fun challenges through an interactive learning process, meaning learning by doing right here, you can actually max out all your scientific skills, like an absolute MMO Imba character, okay, like, like a Final Fantasy for nerds character, something like this. <laughs> and if you are like me and you just love doing, you, you love exercise and you just love practicing over and over again, then this is really the website for you because they really want you to learn actively. So, so if you want to try it brilliant, if this sounds like this is something for you, take a look at the top of the description. There will be something slash flamble maps, a link down there and you can try out brilliant for free today. Also, the first 200 people to sign up get 20% of their annual premium subscription. So it's a great way to support the channel and to try out Brilliant for yourself. And maybe it's something for you. And if it's something for you, then congratulations. It, it's really fun to do this stuff on the website. So if you want to support the channel, try it out. And up until the next video, have a flamble day. I hope you did enjoy the special video. Ciao.